The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up front and center on today's show, we'll discuss how Bronx Works is addressing the issue of food insecurity. Then afterwards, we'll learn about a not-for-profit organization focused on providing New York City students with tech, practical skills, and opportunities to succeed. And then we'll discuss how another not-for-profit is dedicated to improving students' reading skills. And then we'll also be introduced to an organization that's providing affordable housing to low-income households. And then we talk about the new series happening at the Bronx Music Heritage Center. More on that later on in the show. And then we speak with the founder of the Mandala Cafe on how the company is promoting dignity to all around the issues of food, education, and employment. So stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. everyone and welcome to open i am darren jaime you are watching a live and interactive program that takes place across the bronx and new york city today is july the 28th we also want to take the time to welcome our viewers who are watching on manhattan neighborhood network as open is being broadcast live simultaneously on our mnn channels we encourage you stay connected to us on open at BronxNet TV. And you can do that by watching our website or checking the website, I should say, at BronxNet.org and all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV. Well, a lot has been going on throughout the course of the past week. We'll take you through a couple of things with our Bronx updates. We start off with coronavirus news. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio recently announced the city's public hospital and health clinic workers will soon face a mandate to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, the mayor hinted the city's gentle touch towards encouraging vaccinations could be at an end, especially as the more contagious Delta variant of the coronavirus drives up cases in the city as well as across the nation. Mayor de Blasio stated, quote, we have the solution to the thing that is killing so many people and is now threatening once again, our ability for people to make a living. Why is this hard just to get vaccinated? The mandate will require health workers in city run health hospitals and facilities, as well as health clinics to get the coronavirus vaccine or else submit to weekly COVID-19 tests. The policy will likely take effect this August. Well, in other news, Bronx Film 48 kicks off their third annual Bronx 48-hour film challenge at Circle of Dreams, inviting filmmakers of all levels to write, shoot, and edit film in just 48 hours. Our Bronx Net reporter, Sanji Lopez, brings us a story right now. Write, shoot, and edit a film in just 48 hours. This is how 12 teams spent their weekend participating in the third annual Bronx 48-hour film challenge. We think the best way to become a filmmaker is to make films and watch films. And what better way to become a filmmaker than right here in your very own community, right here in the Bronx. The free event kicked off at Circle of Dreams in Highbridge and was open to filmmakers of all levels of experience. Team leaders received their rules and guidelines, film genres, and their required Bronx landmarks at random. It was very challenging and it makes you push yourself to the limit and you can create beautiful things that you thought you could never do. I would help out with other people's films, you know, not my own. 
own. So this time, you know, we, I got to do my own movie, wrote it out and knocked it out and I can do it. This is my third time at a 48 hour film uh, challenge. Uh, this will probably be the best one so far because this is the one that we're, I feel like my team is just leading. We actually got horror last year, so it was really challenging, um, but it's really fun. I think it opens up your creativity, really pushes you know to work hard and work fast and as a team. I just locked down a camera and some sound gear today. We may even have some lights, but we have a bit of a team, maybe a couple actors, so We'll see what happens. Teams were also eligible to receive awards with prizes ranging from free camera rentals to B&H gift cards and even cash. But the goal of this challenge? We are trying to enhance the culture of cinema in this borough by increasing the number of filmmakers through free and low-cost accessible programming. All completed films will be screened in the Bronx very soon. Follow at Bronx Film 48 on social media or visit BronxFilm48.com for more information to view previous year's submissions and stay tuned for next year's challenge. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. And thank you, Sanji. And that is all the time we have for our Bronx updates, but we're not out of show. Stay with us. Open does continue. We're opening up right after this. Bronxworks is a not-for-profit organization helping individuals and families improve their economic as well as their social well-being. Now, Bronxworks strives for the highest ethical and performance standards and remains committed to food justice as well as addressing food insecurity issues here in our borough. Joining us now to share more details is the Program Director of Community Health Programs at Bronxworks, Rachel Gill. And uh, Rachel, good to have you. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to be able to have this conversation a little bit to find out a little bit more about Bronx Works, because I know you guys have been inundated, uh, especially in this pandemic. Before COVID-19, we know that food insecurity was a huge issue. Uh, but now, even more, uh, more and more people are coming through your doors. Absolutely. We've seen a huge increase. I think that um, folks are really relying on us as an agency to show up for them during this time. Um, I think the Bronx was obviously, as we all know, very disproportionately um, affected by COVID-19 um, and that there were a lot of inequities prior to COVID and they've only been exacerbated. Um, so it's really important that we are there for the community. Um, we've seen that increase in our food pantry participation. Um, we saw a huge increase in traffic in our farm stands. Um, there's also been a huge need to seek our services during COVID. Um, we were at first didn't know what to expect. Um, we didn't know that the community wanted to still take our health workshops. They really wanted that connection, that information, those resources um, during that time. So they really reached out and said, you know, if you have, we want to be in your virtual programming. Um, we had transferred all of that programming online from and they showed up full force. Yeah. And I know that when you talk about food insecurity and really dealing with the issue, one issue that gets overlooked sometimes is, is youth food justice and the amount of young people that are really out there and struggling. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So we have a youth food justice program. Um, so what that does is it helps youth get involved in helping the community um, and get involved in learning about um, things that they can do for themselves and their families to get the resources that they need. Um, 
And that includes them um, being involved in working at our farm stands um, and getting involved in the summer youth employment program so that they get a paycheck um, for all of the hard work that they do. And they also get to have that knowledge um, and let their families know to come to the farm stand. Um, we also have curriculum for them to learn about um, and let their voice be heard. So we really, we really give them um, the ownership of the program and let them educate the community. They create advocacy projects. Um, they created a lot of sugary drink videos for us. Um, they, take, they take part in some culinary trainings um, where they get to learn culinary um, skills in our Team Battle Chef program. So it really lets them um, learn about those issues that they are not alone um, and that they can be empowered to, to be part of the solution. Yeah, uh, I want to just go back just a little bit because you just talked about the community farm stand and I want to take a little dive into that. Uh, very powerful. Uh, you got your youth involved in that. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with the youth community, I mean, with the community farm stand, introduce us to it. Sure. Um, so we have two seasonal farm stands um, through Bronx Works. One is at 1130 Grand Concourse um, at our main sort of community center site. Um, and then the other is at in Ma Haven at 545 East 142nd Street. Um, and both um, offer the community affordable local and regional fresh produce. Um, and really the model is that those are part of the community um, and that they are community run. Um, we have community members involved, we have youth involved. Um, and what, they are, what they're there to do is educate and provide the community with those resources. So we accept health bucks, um, their, their coupons. So if they come, they get $4 in coupons already. Um, we take farmer's market nutrition program checks, which are $4 checks. We take EBT. Um, and for every $2 folks spend in EBT, they get $2 in health bucks. And that's up to $10. Oh. Um, so there's a lot of incentives that support the community to make that um, those purchases easier. Um, and so we really hope that folks can come out um, we have all kinds of produce that's grown in New York through a partnership with Grow NYC. Carrots, apples, strawberries, corn, peppers, um, cilantro, tomatoes, you name it, it's there. You name it, it's there. I like it. I like it. I like it. Uh, you guys do a lot uh, in the community, and I know that you try to grapple a whole lot of issues. And one of those is the issue of homelessness. And uh, with that adult homeless kitchen that you've got going, uh, how's that been working? Um, good. Uh, you know, that, that there was also a transition of those folks um, to some hotels in Manhattan. Um, so there was deliveries going down twice a day um, down to Manhattan with the meals. Um, it was quite the operation. Um, and those numbers are up. Those folks are back at our Bronx site. Um, so that has, we've been um, working on our menus, working on improving that food, improving those menus. Um, and it's really important that folks, um, we have a homeless drop-in center at the living room. Um, it's really important that they're fed well. Um, at the Bronx Works mission, um, part of it is to feed, feed, shelter, teach, and support. And we don't wanna just feed um, with stuff and packages, processed food. We wanna feed those folks the best we can with the best ingredients possible. Um, and that, uh, aside from the farm stand, that's also making sure that the food we serve is high quality, culturally appropriate, and tastes good. Um, so that's what we're able to do with those kitchens is really work on improving that and listening to the clients and meeting those needs. Yeah. Have you been able to keep up given the fact that, you know, we've had these COVID restrictions, staffing has been reduced, I know, in, in, a, in a lot of areas and what you can actually do, a lot of restrictions in place. Have you been able to manage? Sure. So the staff has really stepped up. I have to give all the credit to our staff. Um, they've had to individually pack meals. Some of those meals were packaged a family style so in one big package and they've got to do m multiple times more work um, so they really showed up during the pandemic for that um, we also take advantage of culinary interns through partnerships with project renewal where those folks are placed at our agency to help learn their skills and we've actually hired them at the end of their internship we also use summer youth employment program youth um, so i really think that it's the staff and the community um, and interns really stepping up to the challenge. Yeah. Well, Rachel, I know you got your hands full, but you're doing a good job. And so continue the great work that you got going on at Bronx Works and uh, glad to have you on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here. 
All righty, Rachel Gill, our guest here on from Bronx Works. Now, if you want more information, of course, you can always go to their website. That is bronxworks.org. Also on their social media platforms on Instagram at Twitter at Bronx Works. Don't go anywhere. We do have more open to open up to you. So don't go anywhere. We're coming right back in a few. Welcome back. First Tech Fund is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to breaking down barriers and empowering students of underserved backgrounds with technology access, as well as practical skills and opportunities to succeed in the modern world. Now, when the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic shook the world, First Tech Fund was born out of recognizing students without access to technology would fall even further behind as schools move towards online learning. And joining us now to share a little bit more about this is the CEO and co-founder of First Tech Fund, Jose De Paz. And uh, we thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Listen, uh, I really want to get to this issue about the digital divide because uh, in the midst of COVID-19, I think that, that really became further exacerbated. But your organization really does a great job in trying to do a uh, in, in trying to close that gap. Uh, so share with us a little bit about the work that's going on. Yeah, so like you said, we started during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, what we wanted to do was provide uh, technology access, internet access to the many students in New York City who didn't have uh, the, the ability to, you know, sign into remote learning, and we didn't want our students to be falling behind. So our program provides a free computer for students, as well as a hotspot with unlimited Wi-Fi, and students, once in our program, get weekly curriculum and are also paired with a mentor who works in a industry in which they express interest in. Yeah, you talk about mentorship. I want to talk about that for a second because when you talk about that, um, really looking at how a student can progress and how somebody can get better uh, skill, a better skill set, mentorship is key and critical. And give me a little bit about how mentors play an important role in what you do. Yeah, I think it's really important uh, as a young student to have role models and folks that you can go to for support. This year, we saw our mentors support our students on college applications. And through that, we actually saw 23 of our 24 students who were eligible for, for college enroll in schools like Columbia, like NYU, like Fordham. Um, so it was really exciting to see the impact that that mentorship had on students when they had questions about school or college apps or anything else uh, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. How about for students that you had, um, when you look at what's going on now, every student almost had to have some sort of technology in the home and including good internet access. We saw schools rushing to get, you know, the necessary devices back to students so that way they could be able to continue in their learning. What, what can you tell us about the people that you encountered and their access to technology? Yeah, a lot of our students, um, you know, were, were living in situations where they didn't have access to a computer or, um, they had siblings who needed the computer and, and they sacrificed their own um, you know, time in, in education to make sure that their siblings got uh, what they needed. So uh, we had met many students doing homework on their phones or going to neighbors' houses. And so by providing them the technology, we empowered them 
to do better in school, to go to class more often, to get their assignments in on time. And, and that really made a difference. We had a student from the Bronx named Aaron who uh, had honors this entire year for the first time because he had access to all these things. Was it new for you in terms of a revelation that the, so many students were challenged in the area of access? No, I think the digital divide has existed for a long time, right? It's something that we've been talking about ever since I was in school, right? I was in the second and third grade and people were talking about it. Uh, and that was many, many uh, moons ago. So I think it's an issue that's always existed, but it has been exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, and I think an issue that uh, will continue to exist even after the pandemic. So we are, um, you know, wanting to grow and scale as, as much as possible. And this year we grew from 52 spots in the program to 85 in the upcoming school year. Wow. And uh, speaking of the word program, I know also you have a fellowship program and that's really been uh, key and critical for you guys in terms of advancing students to the next level. Uh, how does the fellowship program work? Yeah, so once the, the students apply, our application is currently open until August 2nd. Uh, the students are um, put into our fellowship program. They get that laptop, they get the internet access, they get the mentor, but they also get exposure to uh, virtual programming that focuses on building skills. So financial literacy, public speaking, resume building, and then they also get access to career advice and career panels about law, healthcare, finance, social impact, government, to expose them to the different careers that are out there so they can know and understand what they can do with their futures. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. And what's it like for you? I mean, given the fact that things pretty much ramped up for you during COVID uh, as an organization, uh, how have you met the challenges? Yeah, I actually, um, I was laid off during COVID-19. And so, um, you know, this organization, it just was something I wanted to do for my community. I myself, you know, saw my mom work two to three jobs for me to have access to internet in my home. And so I was really grateful for um, that sacrifice that she made. Um, you know, that, that internet access, that, com that computer in my home led to me getting a full ride scholarship to college. Right, and mm -hmm. I can, I can see that clearly. So I knew that I wanted to do that for others, and even though it was hard during the pandemic, I think it was a worthwhile thing that that we focused on, and and I'm very happy with the the results so far. Yeah, and before I let you go, I know you've got a deadline coming up on uh, August the second, and uh, share with people who may want to be interested in taking part what August the second means. Yeah, so we're looking for our next cohort of students, uh, rising ninth graders uh, through 12th graders. Uh, the only requirement is that they go to school in New York City uh, full time. There's no immigration requirement. There's no other requirement at all. So we'd encourage um, you know, uh, students to apply. We'd, we'd love to have them as part of our program. Josue, thank you so much for being with us here on Open. Certainly glad to have you. Uh, and the great work that you continue to do in making children's lives better in technology and also access. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All righty. Well, I'll let you know if you want more information, please visit their website, firsttechfund.com, and then follow them also on social media at First Tech Fund. I'm Darren Jaime, and guess what? We will have more open coming up right after this. Partners is a national not-for-profit organization mobilizing communities to provide students with the proven individualized reading support they need 
to read at grade level by the fourth grade. Now they envision a future where all children in the US have the reading skills necessary to reach their full potential. Joining me now to share more details is the Executive Director of Reading Partners, Primo Lasana, and then Community Engagement Director of Reading Partners, Ria Quinones. And uh, glad to have you both here with us on the show. Thank you, we're glad to be here. Good. Rhea, I guess I'll start with you and talk a little bit about literacy, because literacy is a huge issue uh, when it comes to kids in our city school district. Uh, kids not reading really up to the grade level, and particularly that fourth grade level, very critical. So share with us some of the work that you're doing. Absolutely. So you did a great job of previewing what Reading Partners does. Uh, we work directly with students in kindergarten through fourth grades who need a little bit of extra support to become strong readers by the time they're in fourth grade. And I oversee our volunteer recruitment. So we make sure we have all the volunteers we need in order to support those kids. We're very focused on recruiting volunteers from the communities where our schools are located. Yeah, and Primo, I know that, you know, at the heart of the matter is getting kids to really be able to do better. And when it comes to the issue of reading, Honestly, we know that that's a big challenge across the city. Um, so I know there's one-on-one -on -one programs that are also available. What are some of the things that are available to really help students in their enhancement? Yeah, absolutely. I wanna speak a little bit about the urgency of the literacy issue in New York City and across this country. So that's kind of why we do the work that we do. And mm -hmm. we start off with the knowledge that reading is the foundation of all learning for students throughout the course of their education lifespan, right? Uh, we know that according to the 2019 National Assessment for Education Progress, that only 20% of fourth graders from under-resourced communities in New York City are reading proficiently at grade level. We also know that literacy tutoring, particularly for grades K through three, can have a profoundly positive impact on student literacy achievement. I'd say one other really important data point just to name is that when systemically under-resourced students are at reading level, uh, grade lead reading level by the third grade, they're 13 times more likely to graduate on time from high school. So you can really see how important it is to serve students at the kindergarten through third grade level so that they can continue to experience academic success throughout the rest of their educational career. And so <clears throat> equipping students with the foundational literacy skills that they need to succeed unlocks the lasting opportunities that can have a huge impact on their academic achievement and lifelong learning. So that's why we do the work that we do every day. Yeah, very, very uh, important work. And I know you can't do it by yourself. I know there's community partnerships that you have and really public participation. And so I'll come back to Rhea and ask the question about how can community and the public really be involved in helping in this, uh, in this endeavor? Yeah, so let me just first say um, that we're looking for volunteers who work with elementary school students and um, we're looking for community volunteers in the South Bronx and Central and East Harlem on the Lower East Side. And um, our tutors work with the same kindergarten through fourth grade students for a minimum of one hour a week for the whole school year. And tutoring is more than simply reading with a child. Our tutors use a excellent curriculum that we provide to help students learn specific skills to become proficient readers. It's simple and it works. Each of our lesson comes with instructions and materials and a trained program coordinator is on site to support volunteers as well. So no previous experience is required to become a volunteer and volunteers provide us with their availability to volunteer um, and tutor a student one or more hours a week during the school day. So Monday through Friday between nine and three. And if you're interested, you can go to our website, which is readingpartners.org, or you can give us a call at 646-395-3831. Yeah. Prima, I want to ask a question about really how much more have you become challenged in the area of dealing with the whole issue of literacy, given the fact that we are coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic some people say we might be going back in, but we'll just take it on the good side and say we're coming out. Uh, but when we're dealing with what we're dealing with with COVID, honestly, virtual learning, things like that, um, has it caused a step behind? 
Yeah, it's an important question that I think many of us are answering across the societal fabric. Um, few moments in modern history, frankly, have exposed the disproportionate effects that uh, under-resourced populations in this country and in this city experienced during a crisis as quickly as we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic. The unfortunate reality also to name is that remote learning didn't remotely cut it during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? And so we saw many students who experienced learning loss. Uh, and again, we can say that these are disproportionate outcomes, particularly for students of color who are being seen to experience more than double the learning loss as their uh, as other peers. And so while COVID-19 has forced tens of millions of students into prolonged stretches of virtual learning, uh, we took that opportunity to really pivot and move our program into the virtual space. So we put together a program called Reading Partners Beyond. And what that involves are really three things. So uh, resources during the last year for our students and their families to read together an online library. We also increased our levels of family engagement because students were learning from home. And then last and most importantly, at the core of our program is that we moved our literacy tutoring services onto an online platform where our curriculum lives and tutors and students can connect one-on-one. -on -one. I think that this innovation has really informed the future of our organization. And so while we were typically before the pandemic offering services in schools, we are now gonna have the opportunity for our students to be in schools this coming year, hopefully, fingers crossed, right? Uh, and also we're gonna be able to bring in volunteers from anywhere across New York City using the virtual platform. So we're really excited about this coming school year. Uh, and we were also able to continue to provide services to our students who were learning from home over the course of the previous school year uh, and really give them the opportunity to continue to learn during a critical year so we could avoid as much learning loss as possible and continue to move readers forward in their progress in education. Yeah, well, certainly you guys are doing great work and I definitely wanna thank you for what you're doing. Hopefully as we get towards uh, the school year, we'll be in person and students will get a better chance of advancement in this critical, critical area. Thank you so much, Primo. Thank you so much, uh, Rhea, for being with us here on Open. Thank you so much. We appreciate it, Darren, take care. Thank you. All right. I want to let you know now, if you want more information, all you got to do is visit their website, readingpartners.org, I should say, and then on social media. You can see them on Facebook as well. I should say Instagram and Twitter at Reading Partners. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We've got more open coming up right after this. to the show. Our next guest was recently elected by the National Least Housing Association as its president during its virtual annual meeting in Washington, D.C. Now, she is the senior vice president and general manager of Phipps Housing Services Incorporated, and she also has a 30-year career that's dedicated to providing affordable housing to low-income households in many cities like Cleveland, Chicago, New York, and of course, New York City. Joining us now to share more details is Kathy Pennington. Uh, Kathy, glad to have you here on Open. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I always love talking about affordable housing. It's one of my favorite topics, so it's it's great to be here. Yeah, affordable housing is one of those things that's really a challenge across New York City, and we know that, right? We know that uh, high pricing, you know, affordable housing is sometimes 
hard to come by, but you guys really have had a longstanding history of really dealing with affordable housing and providing to many across New York City. Yes, Phipps Houses is uh, the oldest uh, nonprofit um, housing organization uh, in New York. And I, I believe we're also uh, the largest uh, developer and provider uh, in the nonprofit sector. And uh, we're very proud of uh, the work that we do. And um, the, the fun part about my involvement with the National Lease Housing Association, it's a, it's a national um, organization that engages with both developers and property owners and the government. So it kind of covers all the areas in our business around affordable housing. So it's a great intersection with people who touch the business. And it's a great way for um, anyone who works in, in uh, affordable housing to stay connected with, uh, with all the rules, regulations, the new trends that are happening um, and to be able to spend time with other colleagues across the country. Yeah, what's it been like for you uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic dealing with uh, affordable housing as many people are you know, still struggling? Yeah, we continue to struggle. Um, you know, our properties are, are um, primarily all located in very low income neighborhoods, uh, the same neighborhoods that have been, you know, seriously challenged um, with COVID. And it has put a lot of uh, stress on our organization because um, our staff uh, who work at all of our buildings, they can't work remote. Um, our staff have to be at the buildings every day our porters, our building superintendents, our property managers. So it's been a stressful year. I must say though, I think our staff really stepped up, really cared about trying to keep the property clean and safe during you know, this whole COVID. And I think they've, they've done a great job. It, it hasn't been easy um, and it's put more work on them, but um, I really feel that our staff stepped up. Yeah. How hard was it to keep up with the ongoing challenges? You know, one day the CDC says this, the state says this, and now you've got different mandates that you have to really adapt to. What's, what was that like? Well, you know, I mean, we, we kind of look at it from two facets. One is making sure that all of our tenants have access to a lot of information about, initially it was about testing, and then, it, you know, it was about uh, getting the vaccines. So we've tried to you know, just be a pass through on making sure we get information to our tenants so that they can get um, the uh, vaccines and get all the latest information. Um, and our, our partner, uh, Phipps Neighborhoods, uh, or yeah, Phipps Neighborhoods, um, who is also a part of um, our organization, has also done a, a lot of outreach um, to our uh, tenants to try to facilitate any assistance they might need. We have a number um, of senior buildings. So in particular, we were very concerned with seniors. And again, we have social service coordinators at each of those senior properties. So they've been wonderful about making sure our tenants um, have information and access um, to uh, the vaccines. And then the other side of it is employees and trying to make sure our employees are taking all the necessary steps to stay healthy. We did have a number of employees um, get sick with COVID, unfortunately, myself included. Um, um, and uh, we've all you know, survived and that's, that's really the good news. But we still have more work to do to get, to get more people vaccinated and to uh, try to stabilize uh, yeah, and we talk about more work to do. I know when we talk about New York City, affordable housing development is in that category as well. More work to do. Um, what are you hearing and what do you have on your end when you talk about more development in the area of affordable housing? Well, we are, we are actively uh, continuing development and we have several properties um, actively either leasing brand new buildings, actually two up in the Bronx, um, that uh, we're leasing. One is called Caldwell and the other is called Metcalf. They're both beautiful, brand new construction buildings, all targeted to folks um, anywhere from, we call it 30% area median income and up. So we're really trying to serve 
um, very low income individuals and families. So those two properties are already being leased. And then we have under construction um, a major development out in Queens um, uh, uh, in Forest Hills, uh, and then also a, a significant project out in Far Rockaway, where we'll be building approximately 1,700 units of affordable housing. So we're really growing and expanding. Um, as you know, uh, the demand for affordable housing um, has not is nowhere near met. So um, we're pushing forward and continue to, to grow and try to provide more housing um, every year that, we're, that we continue. Yeah. Well, Kathy, it's been great having you here on the show and thank you so much. And uh, I know you got a, your hands full and a lot of things coming up uh, down the pike. So best wishes and uh, we hope to have you back. Thank you so much. It's been great speaking with you. All righty, Kathy Pennington, our guest here. Now, if you want more information, please visit the website at phippsny.org. We do have more show coming up. We want you to stay with us. Open does continue coming up right after this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. And welcome back. Although the Bronx was once a hub for music creation and performance, the disinvestment in the 1970s and 80s destroyed many performance venues devastating the music scene. As a result, access to the arts and cultural programming has become very scarce here in the borough of the Bronx. Created by WETCO, the Bronx Music Heritage Center is committed to preserving and promoting Bronx music, cultivating Bronx artists, and then spurring neighborhood revival, as well as providing free cultural programs for the community. Here to tell us a little bit more is the co-artistic director and curator at the Bronx Music Heritage Center, Elena Martinez, and then photographer and author, Joe Conzo Jr. And uh, welcome both to the show. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. And so as we talk a little bit about this here, honestly, uh, as I said in the intro, yeah, a lot of the music dissipated during the 70s and 80s, particularly venues, um, but you guys are doing something in terms of uh, reversing the course, if you will. Uh, so Elena, share with us a little bit about it. So, well, hi, um, my name is <clears throat> Elena Martinez. I'm one of the core artistic directors of the Bronx Music Heritage Center, which will soon be the Bronx Music Hall at our new space. Um, I'm, I'm one of the artistic directors along with Bobby Sanabria, the jazz musician who grew up right in Melrose, that neighborhood where our new space, the Bronx Music Hall, um, will soon be open. We um, were part of what goes Bronx Commons building. Our, the our indoor theater will be open very soon. But right now we are currently doing outdoor events at our plaza there, um, right across from Bodica College. And as you mentioned, that you know there was a time, right? The, the Bronx has this rich history of music, um, whether it's uh, hip hop, um, all the the being called the, the borough of salsa. Um, but you know, it's actually right now it's a really exciting time to be in the Bronx because there's a lot of great things happening in the Bronx musically. There's so many communities that are making um, music and adding to the soundscape. There's um, you know large African communities, large Garifuna communities that are like larger like one of the largest diasporic communities um, of African communities and Garifuna communities are here in the Bronx um, Bengali musicians so there's a lot of new things happening so there's a lot of creative energy and music out there and there's a lot of a, a lot of organizations actually doing a lot of different events too we're just um glad to be part of this sort of like um you know um soundscape landscape of organizations that are able to present all this great 
um, all this great music, all this great culture that has always been a part of the Bronx's legacy and I think still remains, even though we have this history and these sort of stereotypes of all this things that went, went on a generation or two ago, you know, with the devastation and the displacement. But um, I think they're, you know, the, the Bronx is um, sort of reclaimed. It's great. Um, you know, great title as a great place for a culture. And the Bronx Music Hall hopes to be at the at the center of that. And I'm really glad we get to work with Joe because he's on our music, not only being a, a great photographer and friend, he's on our music advisory board as well. Yeah, and he brings his artistic talents. And uh, honestly, to be able to capture some of this, Joe, talk to us about uh, your participation and then also the fact that, you know, you've got a book as well. Well, I, I'm just excited that, um... I'm part of this whole new generation of venues coming up, like the Bronx Music Heritage Center, like Elena mentioned, um, you know, that stigma about the Bronx, you know, listen, throw that out, the, throw that out. The Bronx is alive and kicking, especially with the Bronx M Music Heritage Center. And like she mentioned, I sit on the advisory board there with other great musicians and pioneers like Grandmaster Kaz and so many others. But um, I'm just excited to support and to, you know, young artists, new artists, old artists, so to speak, and just, you know, get the word out there that the, block, the, the Bronx is alive and kicking and so much is going on. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to publish my book, Born in the Bronx, republish it this past uh, month or so. And um, it's an expanded version of uh, my book that um, LL Cool J wrote the intro to it. And uh, I, I'm just excited to share it with the world again, to share it with a new generation of hip hop uh, uh, aficionados that uh, love uh, the old school music. Yeah. And, you know, we're excited because the Bronx Rising series is on its way. And uh, for those people who don't know about it, you know, share with us a little bit about Bronx Rising, Elena. So um, we have a few different series that we do at the Bronx Music Heritage Center and Bronx Rising, as you mentioned, is one of them. That's sort of probably our oldest, our signature series. We do that once a month and it's sort of um, it's sort of like a multi-layered program, which usually when we were indoors um, before the pandemic would have like poetry or film and then and, and then end with a, a concert. Now we have to you know, re reprogrammatic, reschedule a little bit because we're doing it outdoors, but we hope to be indoors really soon and get back to that. We're still doing some virtual events. This this program we have tonight with Joe will be um, with um, will be um, virtual, but we also have live programming too. So people should follow our Facebook page to um, um, BX Music to um, see what's coming up. Yeah, Joe, how difficult is it to do a virtual program of this magnitude, knowing that uh, when you talk about arts and entertainment, it's really a hands-on field. I. Uh, you know, Darren, it, we adapt and overcome. That's just Bronx period. You know, you adapt and overcome and you make do with what you got. And, you know, so I'm, I've kind of like transitioned off into this Zoom world, and things that of that nature. But, you know, things are opening back up and slowly but surely, baby steps, we'll, we'll get onto that hands-on visual, touchy-feely stuff. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. But in the meantime, we make do what, with what we have and, and we make it happen. It's about the information. It's about sharing the information and the Bronx Music Heritage Center with Elena and Bobby are just doing phenomenal work over there. And I'm just so proud to be a part of it. Yeah, Elena, I got a little bit less than a minute left, but I just want to get to talk to you about this. Absolutely want to bring this up. To have a mixed use facility and to be able to have these venues in a mixed use facility, uh, talk to me just a little bit about what that means. Um, you know, it, it, it's really incredible because Bobby and I are both from the Bronx. So to be able to present and bring to work with all these incredible artists at in the in the Bronx where we were we're from is a it was an honor and just a you know just fun to to be able to do that. And um the space is really beautiful. The new theater will have um 250 seat theater, which will be able to be used for 
theater type performances as well as um, dance. We can move the chairs and have dances. We'll have a great um, exhibit space with um, a reception area. We have um, a dance studio that'll be in there. So we hope that we can you know, work with the community in different ways for sort of programming, for workshops, for classes, um, to work with all, all members of the community. So we're really looking forward to have the space as well as we have this great outdoor, outdoor plaza, which we can do events there. Um, so we are really looking forward to a soft opening this fall and then our grand opening in the spring for that. Well, great. Best wishes. Best wishes on the event tonight. Joe Conzo Jr., Elena Martinez, thank you so much for being with us here on Open and uh, much success during the summer. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. All right. Talk to you guys soon. Now, listen, I want our viewers to know if you want more information, what I want you to do is visit the website. This is bronxmusic.org. And of course, you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram at BX Music. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We've got more Open coming up. We'll return right after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's gonna go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. And welcome back to the show. The Mandala Cafe is a not-for-profit business with a mission to provide dignity and mutuality around access to food and employment. Now, in May of 2020, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, plus local food insecurity and unemployment, the business resumed its weekly community meal, serving over 5,000 dinners and offering 350 hours plus a volunteer service. Now here to tell us more is the founder of the Mandala Cafe, the Reverend Daikin Nelson. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. And so really uh, at a time when there was great needs, you really stepped in and bridged a gap. Uh, how was it for you really being able to deal with this whole issue of food insecurity? It was okay. We've been doing this for a number of years now, and we had to take a break because of uh, kind of <clears throat> a kitchen logistics issue, but then when things shut down, and so then I found another way for us to be able to continue to provide our weekly meal. Uh, and then we started up again um, for our Wednesdays on in the middle of May of last year. And so we've been going over, I, this is week 60 that we've done, and uh, we're over um, we're over 12,000 meals now. So there's been an increased need, and we've been able to kind of step up and work with a couple uh, other partners to provide who are providing meals as well as what we provide. Yeah, right behind you is the sign of uh, the logo of your uh, of your cafe, the Mandala Cafe, but it says under it where everybody eats. Correct. Yeah, the, the ultimate goal of the, of the project is to create a community-based cafe somewhere. Um, and that's a much larger project in terms of real estate and um, resources. So what we've been doing is we've been feeding people. And then we've also been doing a 12-week culinary training to give people job skills and then working with them to try to find them jobs afterwards. And then we also have a catering business, which um, is some part-time employment and also kind of on-the-job training for folks. And so somewhere down the road, we'll have a, a cafe where everyone can eat. And the idea is to bring together all the people in the community um, to share space and to fellowship and a meal together. Yeah. So how does the kitchen work? You've got this great kitchen. Uh, talk to us how the kitchen works. Well, right now we're making use of a couple kitchens and we, um, we come together and we cook the food and at this point we're handing it out and so we, we prep it and bag it and then 
take it out to uh, tables on the sidewalk and hand it out to folks who are walking by. And since we've been around for over a year now, there are folks who come every single week and we're feeding people from strollers to uh, wheelchairs, <laughs> kind of the whole spectrum of, uh, of people in our neighborhood. And we don't ask and anyone who wants a meal can have one. Has it taken you by surprise a little bit with COVID-19 being the way that it is, the fact that so many people have been actually affected uh, by this and the way that food insecurity has really ravaged across New York City, a city that's pretty known for prospering, uh, has certainly had its fair share of people really in need. Yes, that's very true. Uh, we, we started, uh, before we were working with a church and we were serving inside, and uh, we, would, we would put out somewhere like 60 to 75 meals. And so that's what we started with. And that first week, those meals were gone in almost like 20 to 30 minutes. And so then we kept increasing and increasing. And now we're handing out over 250 meals a week. So there was definitely an increase in the, in the need. And uh, last week, for the first time, we handed out over 300 meals, and we did that in about an hour and 20 minutes. And so, you know, we could do this, we could either hand out more food or we could do this more frequently, but at present, we're just doing our once a week and somewhere between 250 and 300 meals each week. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with us a little bit about how you comprise your staff to be able to deal with this uh, onswell of people? Uh, we've we've always relied on volunteers so at this point it's myself and one other person who do most of the the cooking and then we put the food in bags and boxes and schlep it down to harlem and we set up inside of uh, first corinthians baptist church which has been very gracious in allowing us uh, space because they're also shut down so they have um, open space and then we prep the foods, we put it into containers, and we make up the salads and put those in containers, and then we bag everything. So we've had a great uh, increase in the number of volunteers who've come to help us out and kind of expanded that network and provided um, opportunities for folks who want to do something uh, to be able to come and help us out. Yeah. What's it been like throughout the pandemic with the course of volunteers with so many people in need? Uh, have volunteers really stepped up? They have. Um, we've, from the very beginning, we've been following the protocols of we've been masked and we, when we first started, we were socially distanced. So we had like one table to pack the entree and one table to pack the salad. And then we hand out, you know, kind of bananas or bars and uh, water. And so all of those were social distanced, and so people felt comfortable coming in and helping out. And then as more people have gotten vaccinated, um, we still are masked the whole time. Uh, and uh, people have been very responsive to, responsive to the idea of coming and doing something, being able to help out in whatever way. And then we also have uh, donors who have seen the need for this and have been um, stepping up to do that as well. Well, Reverend Dykin, thank you so much for taking the lead in really what you're doing. I think you're providing a much needed service to our community uh, in a time like this. And unfortunately, uh, it looks like the need will continue for some time to come. But uh, thankful to you and your volunteers. And uh, great to have you here with us uh, here on Open. Thank you very much. And thank you for your uh, letting people know about uh, our offering. No problem. The Mandala Cafe. Listen, now, if you want more information, we encourage you visit their website, mandalacafe.org, and then follow them on social media at Mandala Cafe NYC. Well, we have come to the end of our show today. We want to thank all of our guests for joining us, and most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, of course, you can catch it on Optimus Channel 67 and also Verizon Files Channel 2133 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. I am Darren Jaime, letting you know that you can catch a brand new episode of Open on Friday with my girl, Rena Valentine. She'll bring you the best in arts and entertainment. Until then, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and most of all, let's keep this channel wide open.